be prepared that your present and your future can be completely different to your past and accept that that change can happen far quicker than you can possibly imagine. Hi, I'm Tom Martin. I'm a cinematographer and a creative director of an award-winning video production agency called Forward. I work on a lot of different projects. As a cinematographer, I tend to specialise in commercial, branded content, narrative and documentary projects. And as a production company, Forward specialises in story-driven, branded content, commercial and corporate work. I'm a big believer in picking the right tools for the right job. I don't really think there's any one perfect camera or perfect kit that will cover you for all the different types of work that you do. That being said, throughout my career, I have tended to use Canon cameras quite a lot. I think that they're really, really good. They cover a lot of bases and tick a lot of boxes in the kind of work that I've done. Uh, I started off, like many people, with a, a Canon 60D, and I moved on to a C100 and then a, a C300 Mark II, and I still use Canon cameras to this day amongst uh, cameras from other manufacturers. As you can imagine, as a, as a cinematographer, I uh, have a lot of different kit uh, and it would take forever to go through all of the different kit that I use. But generally speaking, uh, I have quite a lot of EF, Canon and other manufacturers uh, glass, which is sort of my personal kit. I tend to hire in uh, lenses on larger projects because I think uh, sort of picking lenses on a per project basis is really important. Other than that, I've got a huge range of sort of camera support things like easy rigs and tripods and dollies, uh, lots and lots of lighting, monitors, wireless video, you name it basically. All of the stuff that I need as a cinematographer and we need as a production company to create really high end, really good quality work. And really, when I'm picking kit, generally, whether it's a lens or a camera or a support system, it, it needs to make my life easy on set. It needs to get out of the way and let me do something better, quicker, easier, faster, and ultimately just let me concentrate on capturing the story. Because whether I'm a cinematographer or whether I'm working uh, from a production company, that's what I'm being, getting paid to do. So kit that sort of supports that is really important. I can't be doing with lots of fiddly solutions. I'm looking for kit that just sort of helps me. One of the reasons I end up using Canon cameras a lot is for that reason. They tend to have a really, really nice skin tone rendition really nice amount of dynamic range for the price point that they sit at. Um, they're really easy to use. Uh, they're very much more robust, I find. They work very well in, in mixed lighting conditions. And with some of the features they've added in the last two generations, with things like autofocus, uh, sort of the assisted uh, uh, focus functionality, and a whole host of other bits and bobs, they just basically let me get on and concentrate on doing the job. And I don't have to worry that the footage isn't going to look the same when the client gets it into the edit suite and all manner of other things that just give me the confidence to use them really. So I'm also going to be uh, in the chat this evening, uh, sort of ready to answer any questions. So if you're online, please say hello and uh, I'll hopefully do my best to answer any questions you have as we go through. Now, obviously COVID-19 is continuing to have a, a massive impact on both our industry and the world as a whole. Uh, and what I'd have loved to have done is brought you guys along behind the scenes of one of my shoots or one of the shoots that we're doing. But unfortunately at the moment, we're really having to be careful about limiting the numbers of crew so that we can all work safely. And having a behind the scenes crew along to one of the shoots just, just wouldn't be possible at the moment. So what I'm gonna do instead is take you through the entire process behind making one of our award-winning short films, uh, a film called Neil Adams, which uh, was launched about a year, 18 months ago. Uh, it's currently finishing its film festival run. Um, and just basically go from the very start all the way through the production process and hopefully sort of the main thing I want you guys to take from this really is that kit is a really important part of filmmaking but it isn't the be all and end all. You can't just magically buy a camera that's going to make you a better filmmaker. A lot of good results and a lot of uh, the, the best results we've had have just come from a lot of hard work and actually planning is one of the, the biggest things and that's something I'm going to talk a lot about today. Obviously what I should say is, you know, the title of the talk is about award-winning emotive content. I didn't sort of suddenly set out as a filmmaker to go, right, that I want to make award-winning emotive content. It's just something that kind of I've fallen into uh, making and something that just has happened as with so many things in life and so many things in filmmaking. Um, but I guess first of all I should start off by giving you a little bit of information, a little bit of a history of sort of how I've got into the industry and, and where I've come from and how I've got to the stage where we've been making this kind of content. So I suppose really um, part of the reason I ended up making these kind of films is thanks to 
um, the, the kind of background I have in academic film studies. I studied academic film studies at university and what that basically taught us was to take a film and to, a bit like an engine, strip it down to its component parts and, and figure out what made it tick. And then that sort of, we obviously wrote about those and analyzed them. And, and I think we did, a, we did a reasonable amount of practical filmmaking, but we did a lot more essay writing and, and analysis. And I think that really what that gave me was the tools to kind of figure out what components, if you like, make up a good film. And it's, it's more than just the cinematography. It's more than just any one individual component. I think the thing that makes filmmaking so interesting is that if you do it right, you take all of these different disparate things, you know, which is essentially photography, writing, um, sound design, music, all of these different individual disciplines. And if you combine them correctly as a director or as a team of people, then you can make something that is greater than the sum of all of those parts. And I think that's what makes it such a, an interesting creative medium and something that, you know, has kept me addicted for several decades now and will hopefully continue to do so for the rest of my life. And when I finished university back in 2010, which sadly feels like a very long time ago now, um, we were in the midst of the financial crisis. So any dreams that I had of becoming this sort of filmmaker and I don't know, going and working for the BBC or ITV or some, starting my career like that was sort of very quickly put on the back burner. Um, and I got a part-time job and I then bought a camera um, and started freelancing as a sort of a camera operator. Um, and I, you know, loved it. I've always been interested in cinematography and, and we'll come back to this later, but cinematography is always the thing that, of all of the disparate parts of filmmaking that's interested me the most. <clears throat> I'm very visually driven and that's something that sort of is, I think, very present in all my work. I very quickly realized if I was gonna be able to quit my job and do this full time, I needed to earn more money and after a bit of thought at the time, YouTube was sort of in its infancy and, and businesses were in need of YouTube videos. So I decided because I knew how to do editing and I knew how to sort of come up with an idea for a film that I could just sort of start a production company and start making films for businesses. And at, at first it was sort of a little stopgap measure and then it eventually grew into something much, much more. This actually proved to be surprisingly successful. Um, over the years, I sort of managed to slowly grow the scale of the projects that I was working on and I guess even from the start I was always approaching things from a slightly different perspective than perhaps some of my peers were at the time. I was very much always trying to create something filmic or cinematic which is a bit of a word that's lost meaning today really unfortunately but it's something that felt not just like a, a sales pitch or a, a corporate video as you'd know it. So whether that was the way it was shot or the way that it was lit or the, the fact that it actually tried to tell a, a story with a beginning, middle and end rather than just be a bunch of facts read out on an auto cue kind of thing. And, and I always tried to do that from the start. So from the start, I always tried to create corporate films as they were with a bit more of a filmic edge and, and that wasn't something that a lot of people I think were doing at the time and I on, honestly wasn't always successful at doing it in my early days. There was a lot of facts and a lot of statistics and a lot of auto cues and a lot of people standing in front of roller banners just talking about why people should buy from them and there wasn't a great deal of emotion or story or anything that kind of felt like a film or felt filmic or cinematic in any, in any way, shape or form. So I slowly but surely in my work tried to kind of use the things that I'd learned at university. I, I did a documentary filmmaking course there which was really useful in that regard and trying to inject some of that into my work. So whether it was through the cinematography as I was learning more about cinematography and how to light things and shoot things and frame things in a way that wasn't just kind of standard and and you know obviously things like DSLRs and the, the the emergence of large sensor camcorders and getting that look really helped but also more importantly it was about trying to inject a bit of a story so it wasn't just people talking about themselves or talking about why you should buy from them it was about maybe refocusing or reframing that idea in, in terms of a narrative with a beginning and a middle and an end and it making it about more about the people in behind the businesses rather than just what they had to sell. I'm not trying to suggest that I was doing anything particularly groundbreaking. I'm sure there are other many, many other people doing that kind of thing, but it also certainly wasn't the done thing at the time. And it certainly wasn't everybody's cup of tea at first. You know, there's, I probably won as many jobs as I lost at that point because the style that I was making films in wasn't for, for everyone. And, and that's sort of, I think that's something that carries on to this day and that's sort of part of having your own 
sort of style and, 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 and way of creating things and seeing the world. But sort of slowly but surely, um, as things went on over a few years, I got more and more opportunities to make films in this style. And I started to kind of carve out uh, a little niche uh, making these kind of styles of films. And over time, I would always try be trying to kind of push myself and, and trying to one up the, each uh, video. So whether that was investing in more kit and, and uh, sort of to, to try and increase the production value or whether it was investing in kind of training in things like lighting or storytelling. And I was always looking at what other people were doing and then analyzing other people's work that I loved and, and trying to figure out how I can make mine better. And that's something I still do to this day. And it's something I think it's really important to do is look at other people that inspire you and think, what is it about that work that I love? Or what is it that I'm really responding to? And, and try and figure out how you can maybe incorporate elements of that in, in your own work. And then probably sort of around about 2015, 2014, 2015, um, things sort of shut, started to shift in the industry, as certainly as I perceived it at the time. Um, and that kind of move into more story-driven corporate films, the kind of the concept of branded content sort of became more of a thing. And I think I was sort of able to watch the other films that people, uh, that I really aspired to be like and, and really enjoy the work we're making. Um, and then I could kind of, slowly but surely started to pivot more and more into that way of making things and obviously because it was what people were looking for things just happened to through luck dovetail really nicely and I got a few more opportunities to make something that was a bit more overtly emotive, overtly cinematic, uh, overtly narrative driven compared to a lot of the kind of more run-of-the-mill corporate jobs that were around at that time and then one of these one of these uh, sort of opportunities that I got to make some more emotive narrative narrative driven content was actually for the lovely guys at Wex Photo Video uh, and nearly five years ago now we made a, a series of films called More Than an Image which uh, you can check out on the Wex YouTube uh, which tell the stories of uh, how photography helps uh, people deal with different conditions and different things in their lives. So we, we had an incredible story about a guy called Giles Dooley, who uh, it, was a, it was and is a, a photographer in, in war zones. And unfortunately he stepped on a landmine um, and tragically lost uh, several limbs. And it's, we, we got to tell his story uh, along with an, a number of other photographers. And we just threw everything into that, honestly. We, we spent a couple of months uh, doing the research and being on the road filming. We traveled the length and breadth of the country uh, and doing the editing and, and um, we poured everything into it. It was just, it was sort of a dream project, an incredible brief, one of those briefs that very rarely comes along. Um, and it went really, really well. Our efforts actually thankfully paid off and the films were received really well and we actually managed to win a couple of Royal Television Society awards uh, for those uh, those films, and then we went, went on to do a second series with the guys at Wex and, and won another RTS uh, East award for those films, uh, and then that helped us obviously get even more work like that, and and we've continued to create work in that vein to this day. So at this stage, I'm just going to give you a, a few tips, and we're going to talk about this a lot in, in in more depth later. But I think. The most important thing really when creating this kind of stuff is firstly is planning and we're going to keep coming back to this but as much as you think of the, the these films kind of have their roots in documentary but I don't think they're truly sort of technically documentary but as much as I think there's a perception that documentary films people just turn up with a camera and film and that is a, a mode of documentary filmmaking to make these kind of films that that hopefully if we've done our job right feel really smooth and connected and everything kind of plays off each other there needs to be a lot of planning done you can't just turn up and, and, and film and expect to get that kind of results don't get me wrong you can you can do you can get very very lucky but I think everything you do in filmmaking is, is about trying to create the conditions for success first and a big part of that is, is ultimately planning the other thing really is to try and find a great story and I know that's easier said than done but there are great stories out there everywhere it's just having the right frame of mind to look for them and, and, and consider that they are great stories and it's finding that story but also having a perspective on that story and choosing a perspective as, as film directors we anything that's made is always filtered through our own thoughts and feelings and prejudices and, and, and ideas and it's choosing and developing your own 
perspective, your own lens on the story. And that's really something that takes practice, but that, will, that is what will make your work stand out and, and what will hopefully make your work great. So I've already touched a little bit about my career and how I've sort of managed to get to where I am today. I, and, but it's worth sort of having a little bit more of a chat about career building and hopefully give you guys some, some tips and some insight on what to do to help progress your careers. And I'd say ultimately filmmaking and the film industry is a really difficult career to, to have. It's, it's not one that people get into because it's easy. It's, it's one that people get into because it's a, it's a passion, it's a vocation. It's something that certainly for me, if I wasn't filmmaking, I'd be, I'd be wanting to be filmmaking. It's something that I have a, a need that goes beyond just making money or sort of, it, 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 it's a passion that I have. I, I'd be doing this, if I think if I won the lottery, I think I'd, you know, I'd be doing this ultimately. I'd probably be doing something slightly different and I probably wouldn't be doing as much of certain types of work, but I'd still be filmmaking. And I think that's something that's important to realize. It's not, uh, it's not as glamorous as perhaps people make out, but I'm sure you guys already know that already. And really I can, when I sat down and wrote the sort of my ideas down for this, the really, the biggest thing is that it is tricky to ascribe any kind of particular uh, significance to a lot of the things that happen. Really, a lot of success I've had really, when I think about it, is down to two things, which is hard work and luck. And there is a saying that someone said that, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I think that's definitely true. You have to be willing in this industry to go the extra mile to stand out because even more so today, it was, you know, when I started off 10 or 11 years ago professionally, uh, there was a lot of people doing what we're doing. But now, thanks to YouTube and the democratization of the technology, the wonderful cameras and kit that we can get is so much cheaper than it, it was even five, ten years ago. There's so much more competition. So you need to work hard to stand out. And as I said earlier, you need to make sure you've got your own perspective. Just because you're doing something different to other people, that's not a bad thing. That's actually a, a really good thing. You know, doing something of your own volition and your, in your own style will make you stand out. So don't just follow the crowd and do what everybody else is doing. And the other thing is ultimately luck. You do have to, unfortunately, be very lucky. But if you work harder and you network and you are open to the opportunities that sometimes present yourself, you do get lucky and you do get those breaks. But it's very hard to sort of predict or there's, there's, it's not the kind of career, a bit like a, a medic or a doctor where you, you know, you kind of take your exam and at the end of it, you are a qualified doctor and then there's particular career paths you go down. It's very much sort of make it up as you go, which is for my personality type, I love it. I love the challenge and I love the, uh, the sort of uncertainty, I guess, that comes with it. But it's also very stressful when you get older and when you're trying to plan a life, uh, you know, for kind of boring life type things, it can be very difficult when you don't know necessarily when the next paycheck's coming from. But I wouldn't do anything else, but it's also worth keeping in mind that th that's how the industry works. Another thing to keep in mind, and it's something I say to people a lot when they ask for advice, is that we're, as soon as possible, it's worth having a, an idea about what you want to do and what you, what you want to do and where you want to go and what part of the industry you want to work in. Because the sooner you can start to specialise, even if it's broadly, so even if it's within the camera department or I want to make I want to be a filmmaker that makes branded content or I want to be a YouTuber or I want to work in the costume department or I want to be a camera assistant. As soon as you can start specialising and figuring out which one of the multitude of paths are available to you in the film industry, it's going to make your life easier because you can focus all of your energy on making decisions and choices and working towards that goal. And one thing I would also say though, and I've experienced this in my career, is that don't be afraid that if you get to a point where maybe you've reached that goal or you've, you know, you, you're somewhere along the journey and that you decide that actually you want to do something slightly different, be open to doing that as well. Because this, this the flexibility and the uncertainty in this career but the, it is there, but it also is very flexible. So you can pivot. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, if you've spent 20 years as a makeup artist, you might struggle to suddenly start being a camera assistant, but you can, change paths and, and pivot, but definitely try and specialise in something or try and 
and figure out what's interesting to you and, and just try and try out lots of things as early as possible in your career and figure out what really gives you a passion, what gives you a, a real fire in your belly that gets you up every morning. So for me, that's cinematography. It's always been cinematography. I, I, I love lighting, framing, camera movement, the, the way that all of those things can combine to enrich and to help tell a story. Um, and I, ju I just ultimately, to be honest with you, love getting paid to play with cameras and lights. It's brilliant. And all of that is in service of the most important thing, which is story, which is creating something that moves somebody. So that, those are my two passions. So whether I'm shooting something or shooting and directing something, those are the things that, that kind of get me out of bed and, and keep me pushing uh, in this crazy industry. One of the things that Wex have also asked me to talk about is networking. Um, networking is really, really important. Um, as I've said, this industry uh, is difficult to get into and there is a, another one of those old adages about it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think that's true to a certain extent, but I always like to think of it that the who you know gets you through the door, but you need to have the what you know to back up you getting there in the first place. So it's no good if you're all talk and you've got no uh, sort of no examples to back you up or no experience to back you up. You, you need to have both really. But doing a lot of networking is, is really useful and the networking that I've done over the years has changed quite a lot actually. So in the, in the early days I did a lot of networking with other businesses which was a really great way for me to find the kind of work that I was doing at that time which was making videos for other businesses. As time's gone on, I actually find that that networking, that kind of networking, I still do it, but it's become a little less important to me. And the networking that I do now a lot of is within the industry. And I do that maybe uh, in lots of different ways. I do it obviously on social media via Instagram. I do it back when we could, you know, kind of uh, have coffees and things like that in person pre-COVID and hopefully that will come back soon, uh, doing that kind of thing working with people just on crews and as you progress your career and we'll, we'll come back to this later about the idea of filmmaking being a, a team sport but as you get on to bigger and bigger projects you'll work with other people and you'll enjoy working with those people and the people that you meet on those projects can become great friends and collaborators and can get you onto other projects and can help you further your career and another way that I do that is by working on passion projects, whether they're my own passion projects or other people's passion projects. So I, I shoot a lot of short narrative films uh, and I have done a lot over the last four to five years. Um, and aside from being great experience, let me try out new techniques and things I want to try, they're great ways of networking. They're great ways of meeting people who can potentially work with you and become people that you work with as you progress your career. So. Networking is a massive part of this industry and, and you know, uh, the, other, the other way as well I've just forgotten is, is also trade shows. Um, obviously again, something that COVID has sadly uh, sort of put pay to, but I would recommend going to trade shows as often as you can because they're, they're really, really useful. Not only do you get to play with lots of nice kit and get to look at things that you wouldn't normally do and all those kind of lovely things, it's more about, for me, meeting people that maybe you, you know only online meeting them in real life, sharing stories, work, uh, you know, talking about work and actually creating contacts. And there, there are people that I've sort of met on Facebook groups and Instagram groups of filmmaking that we've then met up in real life at these trade shows and we've become friends and colleagues. And, and building your networks around you is really important. It's a, re it's a really, really important thing because you never know when you're gonna need that last minute recommendation of a gaffer in some far fun country and one of your friends knows somebody. So yeah, definitely do some networking. So one of the other things to talk about is sort of working professionally, because I guess a lot, some of you guys might not be at the stage where you're working for professional clients, you just might be making your own projects, maybe for YouTube or something like that. And others you will be at various stages of your professional career. And I think really when it comes to working professionally, ultimately the most important thing is making your client happy. And I guess the way to do that is fulfilling your brief. And there's a number of different ways to do that. One of those and one of the most obvious ways is to have a clear scope of work set out before you start a project. Having a list of deliverables and having a, a schedule and having a good set of terms and conditions is, is really, really important. And there's a, there's a whole video about 
managing client expectations and, and all that kind of stuff, but, but basically make sure that everybody is aligned about what it is you're doing. It's no good, and I've made this mistake in the past in the early days, sort of your client's expectations being something, your expectations being something else, and by the time you end up with a finished video, nobody's really happy, or one of you is and one of you isn't. That's, that's not a good way to work professionally, and it's not a good way to make sure you get lots of work in the future. One of the best ways to make sure you and your clients are on the same page is just as early as possible, making sure you're asking the right questions. So asking them what does success look like for them, asking them what, what they want people to feel and think and do after they've seen the video that you're making for them. And just basically taking the time before you even think about picking up a camera to make sure that everybody's ideas on the project are aligned. And that sort of links into really something I mentioned earlier, which is about the idea of planning. So much of the success of the projects that I consider to be successful has, has come down to planning. And it's not something, especially early in your career, that you maybe think about a lot or are, are able to do. I know I've done a lot of work earlier in my career where you, know, you just kind of turn up to a, a shoot and you've got a rough idea of what you want to do but you've not really done the kind of in-depth planning and that is often frankly because the budgets aren't there and the clients aren't perhaps aware of the importance of planning but it's something that really needs to be done and I think that I can very much trace the success and growth of my career as I've been able to convince clients to allow me and have more time for planning and also I, as I've slowly but surely realised the vital importance of planning to creating a, a great film. And I, and I guess one of the things you, you think is that, you know, how do I get clients to pay for the planning time that I need to make something great? And the way that I've been successful doing it, it might not work for everyone, is you couch it in terms of it being a money saver because the time and the money spent in pre-production is nine and a half times out of 10 cheaper than the time and money spent on set, especially as your productions grow and things scale, you are literally burning money by the second on a set. So if you've got loads of expensive cameras, loads of expensive crew and equipment on a set, you've got maybe 20 people, you've, you know, you've got to feed them all, you are burning money by the second on a set. But if you've taken the time when the pressure isn't on to think about everything you're doing, you will save so much money and you'll, you might be able to do five days work in four. So now we're gonna move on to the main part of this masterclass, which is breaking down how we made the award-winning short film, Neil Adams. And hopefully, as part of this, you're gonna see a lot of what I've touched upon already about networking, about luck, about planning, all of these things coming together in order to make something that we were really, really proud of and went on to win uh, another Royal Television Society East Award, which was really great for everyone involved. Firstly, a, a little bit of sort of the, the, the origins or the genesis of this project. Um, after we completed the More Than an Image films as a, as a team of filmmakers, we wanted to create something for ourselves that would sort of let us take all of the knowledge and techniques and learning points that we had learnt making the More Than an Image films and a couple of other films that we've made and apply them to something a bit, a bit bigger, uh, a bit longer, a bit more in depth, a bit more uh, sort of narratively more complex, um, just as really a way to kind of stretch ourselves and make something for us instead of for a client. So we knew we wanted to create another emotive, story-driven, sort of broadly documentary style, but very polished in that kind of cinematic way that I like making films style project. Um, but we didn't know what to make it about. Um, we did know that we wanted it to be a much longer film, around about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and we wanted to try out some new techniques and some new ideas that we had. Uh, and most importantly, we wanted the, the narrative to be a bit more complex. We wanted to have a few more narrative beats in there and really just stretch ourselves and, and, and sort of see it as a challenge, something we could grow all of our skills and ultimately have something that we could be really proud of at the end. So the first thing really to note is your mention, I've alluded to this earlier, is that as I said as a team and that's something really uh, that's really really important. I think you can absolutely make fantastic work as an individual filmmaker and there are people making incredible pieces of work that are uh, brilliant as, as an individual filmmaker but one of the things I've learned over the years and I'm a firm believer in is that filmmaking is a, is a team sport. You exponentially increase the success and the quality of the projects you make as you increase the size of the team, basically. 
And one of the quickest ways and best ways and easiest ways to level up your work isn't going to be to go and buy some fancy new lens or fancy new camera or new piece of kit. It's going to be to network with people and find collaborators who can bring their skills to elevate your project. So we had a, a small but capable team for this project. I directed and was cinematographer for the, for the project. We had a fantastic sound recordist on set to make sure that the interview and all of the other audio was recorded in the highest possible quality. I also had a producer with me on set who helped do all of the pre-production and also helped the shoot run smoothly. Then in post-production, we had a fantastic editor who really, really helped shape the story with me and was just vital in making the film as good as it is, honestly. We also then had a, a great composing duo who composed all of the music for the film, uh, as well as a sound designer and mixer, and then finally a colorist. Those people came on board really for the same reason that we were interested in doing the project. And it's, and it's one of the reasons I think doing passion projects for yourself is really important. It lets you try out different techniques and different ideas and, and different things that you've been wanting to try outside of the pressures and confines of client work. You know, you don't want to try something crazy when there is money on the line. As I mentioned earlier, you know, if you've got one idea about a project and the client's got another idea, it's not going to go, it's not going to end well, I can tell you from experience. So passion projects, whether they be a tiny little thing or a, a, a massive sort of 10 minute film like this, it's sort of a, a space for you to try out all of the different techniques and things you've been wanting to try out. And I also think it's important, especially if you've been doing a lot of work where maybe you haven't been able to try out these things and maybe feeling as creatively fulfilled because you're not ultimately having creative control over the project. It's a great opportunity to do something for you as a creative and, and sort of maybe even remind yourself why it is you, you want to be doing the thing that you're doing because sometimes it can be very easy to lose sight of that especially if you're doing a lot of one type of work or another over a long period of time and I think that's what attracted us to doing the project at the time and what certainly attracted the other people who we managed to get involved over the course of the production process to get involved as well. So I'd thoroughly recommend thinking about doing a passion project, even a small one, when you've got some downtime. So as I mentioned, planning is vital. It's honestly one of the biggest things you can do to level up your filmmaking work is start to think more in depth before you even think about picking up a camera about how the film is going to be made. And first of all, for this project, we needed to find a story to tell. One of the big differences with uh, this sort of work as a passion project versus a client project was that the client wasn't coming to us with a, a story ready for us to tell or some ideas about a story to tell. We were starting from scratch and there was no one else that was gonna tell us what to do, which was great, but it also meant that we had to put a lot of work into doing that. And we, first of all, started tackling this by just reaching out to a few people and putting just a general call out on social media for the type of person that we were interested in telling a story about. We knew that we wanted it ideally to be someone that maybe was a craftsperson um, because we wanted something that would have an interesting visual texture to go along with uh, the, the sort of the, the the narrative that we wanted them to tell and we felt that somebody in the kind of the craft sphere whatever that could be it could be I don't know uh, obviously it ended up being a painter but you know it was, could have been a sculptor or a, an artist or, or, or even another filmmaker potentially. We, we were very open to anything uh, and everything at this early stage and we had quite a few submissions but nothing really gelled, nothing really felt like it had the kind of narrative depth that we wanted to kind of mine in this story. It was, they were all, they were all quite similar to the kind of work we'd done before and they would have made great sort of two to five minute little kind of uh, profile pieces, but we, we wanted something with a bit more substance to it. And, um, and it was then that some of the networking that I had done over the years sort of came back and, and proved to be really useful. Cause I remembered uh, meeting Neil many years prior when he was in one of his other careers uh, as a business coach and a business advisor. And I remembered seeing on social media that Neil had recently had a big career change and had started to pursue sort of, I think it was part-time at that time or possibly had gone full-time, his love of painting. And I thought that that was a, a really interesting thing because it struck me as being such a, a radical change in somebody's career and obviously life to go from sort of something that was very corporate and very business to, to being very creative. And I was just really interested uh, about that. And I think that's something that you sort of have to, as a sidebar here, you sort of have to 
hone over the years is uh, sort of your, your, your nose or your ear for a, a good story. And you know, you, I think we all know instinctively what a good story is um, because we hear them all the time. Every, every time we communicate with other people, we're telling stories. I'm telling you a story right now. And w eventually, you know, you'll, you'll perhaps become more consciously aware of what a good story is. And that is a skill as a, as a filmmaker, and especially if you want to make stories about real people, uh, and even stories about made-up people in terms of narrative, it's, it's figuring out what is a good story, and that's something you, you sort of need to hone. But we, we felt that this was a really interesting story, so then we thought that it was probably worth taking uh, the next step of the process, which is to pick up the phone and have a conversation with him. And having a conversation with someone over the phone um, is something that I'd recommend for all projects. Uh, regardless of whether they're a client project or a, uh, a passion project. I think there's, there's so much nuance about briefs and about ideas and concepts that is lost in either an email or written communication. Um, what we do as a production company and what I do whenever any project crosses my desk, I just pick up the phone. Uh, and that might not be something that perhaps uh, some people like doing these days. I know there's a lot of uh, reticence, I think, especially amongst uh, younger people, not that I'm that old myself, but to, to, to pick up the phone. Um, but I think it's really important. I think you can find out a lot about someone by, by talking through uh, their ideas and your ideas in real time. And, you know, whether you, we often pitch it as a discovery call to our clients as a production company. And I think it's really important at that early stage of the project, whether the project's even going to turn out or not, to kind of scope out each other and just to ensure that as I mentioned earlier, your ideas are aligned at an early stage because it might be that your take on something isn't the right fit for this project and a really good way to figure that out before you spend a lot of time and, and often a lot of heartache because we put a lot of our creative selves into the ideas we come up with for these pitches and proposals it, into something is to, to find out whether you think each other would be a, a good fit for the project. And we had a, a phone call that lasted quite a long time. I think we were on the phone for about an hour, an hour and a half, and it became really quickly apparent that Neil has this incredible story, like an absolutely incredible story. And we were then got very excited because we realized that we'd sort of stumbled upon one of those lucky things that I said that, you know, sometimes happens. Um, a really interesting story that we thought had some real depth, that something that would be perfect for the kind of project we wanted to, to tell. So the next stage then was to arrange a meeting in person with Neil. And this next in-person meeting, again, is something that is, I'd, really, I'd really recommend. At the moment with COVID, obviously, that's a really difficult thing to do. And we've had to do a lot of shoots recently where we've not been able to either meet the participant or the contributor in person or uh, sort of go and look at the location we were filming in and, and I know that the, 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 our work has, has had to suffer because of that so I'd, I'd really recommend doing it because it, it, it serves two main purposes really. Firstly, it sort of encompasses a, a tech scout and a location recce so you're turning up and you're looking at the space that you're going to be filming in and as a cinematographer that's really important for me because I can start to see and start to think about how I'm going to frame this space, how I'm going to light this space, how much work, uh, how much space I've got to work with in the, in, in, the, in the first place. Is it a really cramped space? Is it a huge space? Um, what's it like for sound recording uh, is, an, is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, going back to cinematography, is there natural light? At what times of the days does the natural light sort of come in? You know, how does, is, is it going to be that you're going to be better off filming on one side of the space in the morning and the other side in the evening because the, the light will change as the day goes on. Just basic logistic things like, is there parking? How close is the parking? Um, is there a lot of power to plug in lights? Are we gonna have to run battery powered lights? All of these logistical questions that mean that you can hone down everything about the shoot, whether how long it's gonna take to move from one location to another, to how much kit you should be bringing, to how long you should plan to travel to the location in the morning, all of this stuff is vital to, to gather in that first initial kind of location recce, tech scout or whatever you want to call it. The second thing for this type of filmmaking that's really important is it lets us have a, another in-depth, in-person sit-down conversation with Neil. And on this occasion we sat down and we had obviously had some time to mull over the initial uh, sort of ideas and concepts that he had 
brought to us on the phone call and we could ask some more guided pointed questions and we made copious notes i seem to remember we actually recorded the interview on our on one of our iphones um, and we made lots and lots of notes and that's vital because as you'll see later we use those notes to kind of reverse engineer the questions that we'd end up asking neil on the shoot day the final and probably most important thing that meeting someone in person like that does is it starts to build a sense of trust and rapport between you as a filmmaker and the subject of the film. Ultimately with Neil's film it's a very personal, very emotive and hopefully very sensitive portrayal of what is a personal, sensitive and emotive subject matter. Um, and we wanted to make sure that Neil felt comfortable and trusted us to tell the story in a way that would do it justice. We didn't want him thinking that we were going to make it in a way that was exploitative or not matching his wishes. And I think that's something that really can't be underestimated. You need to have a trusting relationship with your subject and your subject needs to have a trusting relationship with you. And that goes that's the same whether that subject is your client or somebody that your client is employing or anyone that you're making a film about that is being interviewed and it's it's about their real life and their real story especially if the subject matter is emotive and personal so we made sure that we went to great lengths to ensure that Neil knew that we were going to treat this subject matter delicately and there were elements of Neil's story that aren't in the film that he didn't feel as comfortable uh, mentioning and also his story is like anybody's life is, is massive so we were able to s set up those kind of um, those kind of boundaries about what he was comfortable discussing, what he wanted to talk about, what bits were relevant um, and we ultimately come away with a huge amount of information uh, about the location, a huge amount of information about the story and having built that trust and rapport and all of that together means that when we come back on the shoot day, our job is going to be a lot easier and the results we get are going to be a lot better. After that meeting, we then went back to our office and we spent a long time going through the notes and the recordings and, as I mentioned earlier, reverse engineering the answers that Neil had had to create a series of questions to ask Neil to elicit the responses that we wanted him to have. The other thing it enabled us to do is if we had responses that Neil uh, said that we particularly liked or phrases or ways of speaking that we particularly felt were very good, we could sort of use our prior interview with him to trigger those during the interview. So we could say, do you remember when you talked about your father's uh, early life like this? He could go, oh yes, I remember. And we can even, in some cases, prompt Neil or any person we're interviewing with sort of snippets that we might have noted down of ways that he had say, said things that we thought would be a good way of saying it. Obviously we try and get as natural a response as possible but certainly the way that I see it is that we're not making strictly a documentary. There's, a, there's an element of cinematic polish to it that necessitates um, making sure that the answers where possible or as good as possible. And it just means that sometimes we have to prompt people to essentially re-say what they've already told us because it would the way they said it the first time was perfect and we can try and help us kind of kind of recapture that spontaneity even though we've gone away and, and planned to do it. The other thing that we created at this stage was a rough story flow. So um, at that point in the process we're not we don't want to lock in all the decisions, but equally we wanted to sort of have a rough idea about how all of these questions and the answers that they produce were going to go together. So we sort of, you know, had some key points we wanted to cover, had a rough idea of sort of what in what order the story should be, where we would start Neil's stories off, how we would develop it. We always knew that the death of his father would be sort of the key turning point in the narrative and it would then that would be what would then pivot the narrative off into a different direction. Um, we also knew that we wanted to end on a hopeful message, um, a message of sort of self-improvement and hope and, and change. And obviously change is one of the big themes in the film. Um, and so we, we created a sort of story flow document that was really just sort of a table that has uh, sort of some notes about what would happen at each point in the film, some notes about some visuals. Um, we also write down some rough ideas about themes in terms of things like sort of change and the meaning of art and um, 
lots of other things that the film covers basically and had those sort of as, an, as another document uh, to use to kind of use as a, a lens to th through which to kind of make all of our decisions through basically and as a cinematographer obviously as I mentioned I'm a very visually led filmmaker cinematography is my kind of primary I guess craft skill within filmmaking I also started thinking about the visuals now I knew that you know, we were going to have a small team and I knew that we weren't going to be able to uh, sort of, you know, I don't know, have a massive technocrane or all that kind of stuff. And, and actually, the, the story didn't need that. The story is quite an intimate story. It's quite a, a story that lives sort of quite in the detail of the painting and the, the intimate portrayal of, of Neil's life. So I, I, I sort of, you know, realised that the uh, the equipment that I owned at the time and, and what we'd been using to shoot more than image, which was the C300 Mark II and uh, the sort of Canon EF lenses and an easy rig, um, they, they, they would be perfect. That that sort of suit semi-documentary style uh, sort of way of shooting would be perfect for the kind of the space that we were filming in. I also wanted to kind of try and inject some of Neil's artwork into the visuals. So I wanted to try and frame things in a in a kind of painterly way and light things in a painterly way and try and sort of mirror the subject matter within the visuals so that was something else that i spent some time thinking about looking at references thinking about ways that i wanted to to frame and shoot the uh the, the film and again i had sort of some notes to myself that i produced before we went and shot so as you can see, there's a huge amount of thought and planning that goes into making a film like this, even before we've picked up a camera, even before, honestly, we've even thought about how it was going to be filmed. Well, you know, there's, you have to establish the story, establish the style, establish the themes, establish the narrative, figure all of that stuff out really before thinking about how you might capture the film. And that, I think, is basically why the film is so successful um, is because we had the time to do that because we because it was a passion project in particular but e equally if it hadn't been and we'd been commissioned to make a project like this we'd have ensured that as part of the budget we would planned the several days worth of work that went into planning a project of this scale. So moving on to a bit more about the the kit and the the techniques used as I mentioned we'd be shooting in a sort of documentary style uh, with a very small crew um, and I'd had great success using the Canon C300 Mark II for that kind of work. It was also the camera that I owned at the time and so it just it made perfect sense to to shoot with that camera and I, and I do think that the C300 Mark II and its successor the, the Mark III they're really really ideal cameras for this kind of work. They combine a lot of features that mean that they are very well placed, they've got great colour they have that lovely autofocus, which can be a real help in those kind of fast documentary style settings. They're well built, they're compact, they're not particularly power hungry. So they're, they're really great cameras for this kind of work. Um, in terms of other equipment to use, as I mentioned, I shoot on a mixture of Canon and other manufacturers EF mount glass with the C300 Mark II. Um, I like to shoot a lot with an easy rig and regardless of the, the camera I use, uh, I, I shoot a lot with it because I think it, helps in lots of different ways. It, it means you can shoot at lots of different levels very quickly. You can shoot at shoulder level, but you can also shoot at hip level. Uh, and you can move between those two heights very quickly and reframe very, very quickly. It has a sort of feel of handheld. Um, I'd still think if you want handheld, you should put the camera on your shoulder. There's nothing that's gonna quite replicate that. But it has the feeling of handheld without being anywhere near as fatiguing on your body over a long period of time in particular, uh, especially if you're doing long shoots. Um, it also kind of, it actually has its own creative look of its own. It, it sort of adds a sort of sense of float to the image that feels stable enough that it's not shaky, but feels natural enough that it, it almost could feel like a human observer. And it's, it's something that I enjoy a lot and feature a lot in my work. I, I just really like shooting with those. So that was one of the primary sort of camera movement tools that we used. Um, I was also keen, as I mentioned, to include some more sort of staged painterly style shots. Um, so obviously a tripod, uh, just good old tripod uh, was used for that. And then also a, a small slider just to inject a little bit of movement into some of the uh, sort of more static, not handheld shots. One of the other things I did, which I, I like to do a lot, is um, 
use some filtration uh, in, in the matte box. Uh, in particular, I, I like using, as a lot of people do, um, Pro Mist and Black Pro Mist filters, which are um, diffusion filters, basically, and they, uh, they basically just help to take the edge off of a digital image. They sort of slightly soften um, the image ever so slightly, but they still maintain detail. Uh, and they also help to kind of bloom the highlights uh, of an image. Um, and I often, I use them in whenever I can really just to give images a little bit more of a, a filmic edge. And I, I do like to try and bake as much of a look into the camera, uh, into the footage as possible. So I like to use filters and lighting on set to do that rather than rely on doing it all in the grade. Sort of unusually for documentaries, we framed in two, three, nine to one, which is sort of widescreen cinemascope aspect. Um, I just really enjoy shooting in that aspect ratio. I think it just, to me, always says cinema. And I think it also kind of helps to kind of mark it as not being just a documentary, just a documentary, but like the, the, a lot of documentaries are in sort of full frame, 16 by nine. And I, I like to try and craft something that kind of has the signifiers of, of cinema uh, in it and perhaps more of a, a, of a sort of feature documentary or narrative documentary look. So that was sort of one thing that we did. So we captured in uh, UHD in 25 frames a second because uh, obviously we're shooting in the UK. I, if we were shooting a narrative project, I might have shot a 24, but given that we were gonna be shooting in places with lots of uh, practical lighting fixtures that we can control, I didn't wanna uh, sort of get involved with flicker and the risk of that. So I just stuck to 25, which is the standard frame rate over here in the UK. Um, in terms of uh, other camera settings, uh, we shot in Canon Log 2 in the Canon Cinema Gamut and uh, with the production color matrix, because I find that obviously Canon Log 2 lets you uh, maximize the amount of dynamic range that you can capture. And I knew that there was gonna be a lot of sequences where we weren't going to be able to control all of the lighting in the scene. For example, when we're shooting outside on the beach or um, sort of if we, if we had practicals in, in, in set, uh, as well as sort of dark scenes, I wanted to maximize the amount of dynamic range that we could capture. Um, and obviously, similarly with the cinema gamut, maximize the amount of information and color information we captured, uh, which would be important later in the grade. Um, and the production matrix, I feel personally with that camera in particular, just gives you a nice look, gives the, the nicest, most pleasing skin tones and, and, and the nicest look. And it's the one that I've found the most success with grading. The only other camera settings we'd mention is that we uh, shot at ISO 800, which is the, the base uh, dynamic range of that sensor. Some of the scenes in the dark, we rated, or I rated it at 400, which, um, helps you have cleaner black levels, but it does shift the exposure index down. So you do lose a little bit of dynamic range in the highlights, but given the dynamic range of the scene as a whole, it was worth shifting it down in some of those darker scenes to kind of make sure that the, the noise levels were minimized. Um, I really wanted a kind of uh, high contrast ratios um, with, a, with a very high key to fill ratio. So I knew that there was gonna be quite a lot of darkness, which is something I quite like to do. And I, as, as uh, as it was kind of a, a shoot for me, I knew that I could push that a bit more than I normally would uh, with client work. So I was keen to make sure that the results were as, as best as possible in those kind of situations. In terms of the schedule, uh, we started the shoot on the first day and we started with the interview. And I always like to start in these kind of projects with the interviews wherever possible, because um, I think it's the most taxing part for everyone involved. It's the part that needs the most concentration. And I think it's best to get both the participant and you as an interviewer um, to be as fresh as possible. And it also means that if something really interesting comes up in the interview, maybe uh, something that would inform the kind of B-roll that you'd like to shoot, which is the, the other footage that you shoot, um, then you, you know that straight up, rather than if you shot a load of B-roll and then obviously you've planned, but you can never fully take everything into account. The subject might come up with something really interesting um, and you wanna be able to capture that if, if needs be. Uh, and what I'd say is, you know, obviously, do all the planning, but be prepared to go off script if necessary. Part of being a good interviewer is listening and actively uh, being sort of part of a conversation with your subject. Um, you don't just want to be robotically sitting and looking at the questions and just reading them off. You want to develop a, a, a conversation. Obviously, that's why you've developed that rapport with the subject before and that helps kind of make it 
seem like conversation. You'll get better results from them that way. Um, and you can also often dig deeper and, and ask kind of questions that get better responses if, if you're being an active listener and not and actually listening to what's being said. And it, it is a really hard skill to develop. You have to listen to what's being said, compare it to what you know you want to capture, but also be ready to pivot if something really interesting comes up and maybe adjust your line of questioning to to, to kind of fit, uh, to go more down and, and expand upon something that they've said, but also be ready to kind of tack back to the original line of questioning because you know you need to capture certain points. So it is a very difficult skill. It comes with practice. It helps to be a, as good a listener as you are a speaker. Um, and I, I really, really enjoy it. But it, you know, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interviews uh, over the years, um, and it, it, it's always, always a challenge but a pleasure. The next step was then to start shooting the B-roll and obviously we knew that we wanted to capture a large amount of footage of Neil painting. So one of the things we planned was that Neil was almost finished uh, one of his beautiful pieces of oil paintings. Um, so we pretty much set up the lighting in the scene. We, we lit the space using the existing practicals and uh, had a couple of uh, lights that we could uh, sort of move around and, and, and sort of to, to, to kind of adjust the lighting and pretty much just let Neil get on with it really. And as he started to paint, we would, uh, I would sort of row around on the easy rig and, and capture some footage. And then I might switch to a tripod or a slider and switch lenses from you know wider lenses moving slowly into uh, eventually macro shots of the painting just to kind of capture as much variety of footage uh, of that painting process. Because we knew no matter what happened that that would perform, I don't know, maybe up to 50% of the B-roll footage would need to be of, of Neil's painting. And we also captured some other footage on that day. So we captured the little scene where Neil's having a, a coffee and, and where he's sitting um, smoking, sort of contemplating life. And we knew that these kind of general uh, points, these would be some good kind of general footage to capture that would cover a, a multitude of different options in the edit. And the style that I like to shoot those things in, um, as I mentioned before, it's not strictly it's not strictly true documentary. I'm not just capturing what's there. I am controlling and polishing and manicuring reality, I guess. So um, I'll make sure that if I see Neil doing something really nice, that maybe if I didn't capture it right the first time, I'll ask him to go again and try and capture it better, or maybe ask him to stop and I'll reframe or move the camera or even change the lens to try and capture it from the perspective that I think is best. So you're you're kind of reacting to what's happening, but then always thinking about how you can present that uh, sort of that those visuals or present that action through the lens of the kind of visuals you want to create. And so it's not strictly documentary. It's not strictly narrative. It's sort of somewhere in between. Um, and that's that's how I like to work really. So after that uh, very long day of shooting, we returned to base and we looked through the footage that we captured. And we started taking notes and sort of starting to make what's called a paper edit, which is where you sort of take notes of time codes and start trying to assemble sort of a rough idea of an edit. We also knew uh, and had planned at that point that that wasn't going to be the only day's filming. We knew that we wanted to capture a variety of different t visual textures and locations to try and add some production value and some variety to the visuals of the film. So we also arranged quite quickly to spend another day with Neil where we filmed him looking at artwork in the museum because this was something important that he used to do with his father. Um, have him walking along a beach because we wanted to sort of focus on the, the the beautiful Norfolk countryside which is something that he sort of draws upon a lot in his work and we also scheduled a half day filming at one of Neil's gallery openings. It's also worth pointing out at this point that that sort of thing really is only possible with a passion project because you're you, you, because you'd usually have to have planned all of these shoots in advance uh, to to basically make sure that the the budget was fulfilled properly for the client uh, and all of those other considerations. Whereas with a with a passion project, much as you're obviously going to plan in much the same way, you can be a bit looser and and let the project develop. And that was something because we didn't have a massive amount of experience making something as long as this. We knew that we would need to kind of see how things developed and maybe plan for extra day shooting uh, as the project progressed, which is exactly what happened. As it was a passion project, at that point, after we got to a sort of having a rough paper edit and we'd shot for two or three days, um, we had to put things on hold a bit. Uh, things got very busy. 
uh, for with work. And obviously, at the end of the day, uh, you have to pay the bills and we needed to make sure we had the money to fund the rest of the project. So a little time later, we then returned to the project and at that point, I managed to find an absolutely fantastic editor uh, to come on board and to start to really shape the, uh, the story of the project. So what we then did was uh, I briefed him with what the story was. I passed on the notes that myself and the producer had put together and sort of basically gave him all of the, the documents. And like any good editor, he then went away and brought his own creative input to the table. And this is what I was saying earlier about bringing people on board who can elevate your work. And I think there is an element of, and I certainly felt this earlier in my career, if I didn't have complete control over every single aspect and I wasn't the one pressing the buttons for every single aspect that I'd maybe feel cheated or out of like sort of felt like th that I, I didn't have control over the project but that's not how filmmaking works and certainly as you get onto larger and larger projects you just can't you can't split your time into those kind of ways and and also I think it behooves you to kind of start to specialise in one area and I wanted to specialise in the cinematography and I wanted to specialise in directing so editing wasn't something that perhaps I needed to do the individual button pushing of but wanted to find somebody that was very good and can bring a lot more than button pushing to the to the job and their own creative input and their own lens to view things through. So we got to the stage that after a little while of work and it was a lot of work because we had a lot of footage um, we got to a, a really good rough cut stage, but we, we realized that there were some visuals and some sections of the films uh, that l were missing visuals um, because we'd always planned to go back and shoot some more. But because we've managed to get a really nice first cut together now, we had the luxury of being able to be quite specific with our planning for that part of the project to capture the footage that we needed to fill in the gaps that we needed. And the footage that we captured for this part um, were a little bit more staged. We were a lot more specific about the individual shots we needed and the, that part of the, the shoot was a, was a lot more staged. So it was the part, for example, where Neil is opening the box and looking through his father's possessions and uh, the part where he's walking through the pine forest and the part where he is uh, teaching a new generation of artists. And those were deliberately a lot more stagey and a lot more focused uh, in order to kind of give the finished film as a whole that feeling of of kind of quality and that feeling of the the narrative and the visuals being really enmeshed together, so um, that's that's how we we did that bit basically. So after we'd captured all of uh, that extra footage on that final day of shooting, we then gave it back to the editor and he worked really hard to finesse that into what eventually after a few revisions and you always have to go back and forth with the editor to make changes and decisions and revisions um, and again because this was a passion project we had the the luxury and I guess the necessity of this taking a bit longer than it would have done if it was a, a client project where the deadlines and the the schedules are a lot more compressed we got to the point where we felt happy and we had a, a locked cut but the the story of the film as such is far from over because now we've got a locked cut we then need to move on to the next stage of post-production so like many films and many filmmakers we used a, a temporary uh soundtrack for the edit it was something that evoked the kind of overall mood and feel that we wanted so like many people in that situation we we couldn't unfortunately use the music that we'd use as a temporary track and, and nor would we really want to because it wasn't specifically composed for our film depending on the the budgets and the type of project we're working on, we, we usually get music from two different places. The first one is from library music from places like Premium Beat or Artlist or Audio Networks or any of the, the library music places out there. And the second route is through bespoke composition. And for a lot of projects, that's too much money. Um, it is not as cheap as going to somewhere like a, like a, a library service. But uh, the advantages it brings with something that's as, as long and complex and, and, nar and narratively complex as this project is that it enables you to have complete control over every second of the music. And you can use that as a, I will often think of it as a literal kind of series of dials and sliders to at every, any given second of the film dial up or down a certain element of the audience's perception of something or the audience's emotion of something and, and ultimately you're not doing what you have to do with library music which is you have to make your edit fit 
the library music or try and edit the library music to fit and it sort of you sort of are kind of trying to sometimes force a, a round peg into a square hole with a music composition you can have something that is like a tailored suit it's perfectly cut and measured for every at every single point in that film so we we knew that that's what we wanted for this film because we knew that it, it needed that um, and we were incredibly lucky to ha because we had the rough cut ready and uh, that is a really useful calling card at that point. Through some more networking that I'd done, I was introduced to a, a really fantastic composing duo who uh, came and worked on the project with us. Um, and they absolutely knocked it out of the ballpark. There's, there's no two ways uh, about it. I mean, everybody did on this project, but their input um, was so much better than I, than I even hoped, dared hoped it would be. And they composed a beautiful soundtrack of music which is actually on Spotify now which is kind of like one of those little tick life goals achieved of uh, having a, a soundtrack for your film available to listen to on Spotify and it's beautiful and um, we, we sent them the temp tracks and they totally got it and they're able to do things with music composition that are incredible the characters the character of Neil has a theme and that theme evolves as the film goes on and they were able to dial in uh, at every point of the film the correct emotional response from the audience. Uh, and that is the power of a music comp composer. And just like the relationship I was talking about with you and a client, the relationship between you and your team is really important. And they were able to decipher my very non-technical musical desires for the project and kind of get what I was saying about the feel and the vibe and that I wanted and actually translate that into actual music um, and their input has elevated the project massively and I think at this point it's also just worth as another sidebar talking a little bit about sound because I think as filmmakers and I, I certainly see this as, a, as somebody that is really interested and concentrates on cinematography it's really easy to forget about sound um, and sound is I think as George Lucas said more than half the picture and especially in a film where you're telling a real story via an interview you need to have good sound. Otherwise, you're, you're lost. You'll lose the interest of the audience. Ultimately, as much as I'm a cinematographer and I love cinematography and I want all of my films to look amazing and anything I work on to look amazing, I think the reality is you have to accept that people will watch something with good sound and bad visuals because they'll still be able to follow the story. The reverse is not true. If your thing looks incredible, but it sounds tinny and echoey, not only won't, will people not be able to follow the story, but it immediately lacks a feeling of quality, which will turn people off to the project and the work that you do. And that is one of my sort of tips in terms of improving the quality of your work, especially if you're a filmmaker that's perhaps thinking about investing in lenses and cameras. Invest time in thinking about the sound that goes into your project. And I would say invest in hiring people that are experts at sound recording to come and do that on your project because it will pay dividends in the end. So once the score was completed, and again, that took a little bit of time, there was a lot of kind of processes of revision and, and adjustment, um, we moved on to the next part of post-production, which is also to do with sound, but is to do with sound design and sound mix. So these are, are two different things, um, in this case, both handled by one very talented person. Um, and again, it's another layer of the post-production process that some of you guys might know a lot about, some of you guys might not. But it's something that we always like to do whenever we have the budget because again, it just adds another layer of polish and quality to the end product. And the sound mixing is basically ensuring that everything that goes into the sound, so there are, there's the score, there's Neil's voice, there's the sound effects, all of those things are constantly, again, using that metaphor of dials and, and, and sort of levels, literally in this case, adjusted all the time to make sure that the audience is hearing exactly what me as a director wants them to hear. So most of the time that is Neil's voice because Neil's voice guides this narration. But at other times we might want the music to come up or 
fade away slowly or maybe we want to have a, a, a transition or a transitional element with a, a sound effect and that's where the sound mixing process comes in and it, it just means that no matter also no matter what device they're watching this on whether it's on a massive cinema screen a film festival or, or on a phone or an iPad or any other device that it, it sounds fantastic and that it's clear and you can understand what's being said and the story that's being told. The sound design process is, is linked to that and is done at the same time, whereby we obviously captured a huge amount of sound um, during the shoot, but then you can often add to uh, the, the film by using what's called Foley, which is sort of sounds that are, that are recorded specifically uh, for, for this film. So like, for example, um, the part where the, the cork pops off the lid of turpentine oil and there's sort of the sound of like a rushing sound as we transition into the uh, into the forest, and then the, the sound and the feeling of a pine forest. Those were all designed and added in in post from a combination of sort of things that the sound designers already recorded and specific things that they would have uh, recorded for this for this project. And that is something again that just adds another layer. You you can help the audience that, that that transitional element is nothing without that sound design because you're then putting taking that audience on the literal kind of oral journey that neil is describing as he as he talks about the turpentine oil so it it's and that that kind of thing is present throughout the entire film whether it's sort of just re-recording the sound of the the paint brush on the on the canvas or the scraping of the the, the, the easel and the palette knife um, it's making sure all of those things if we want them to be featured and focused are are there so that's another process that happens and then finally once all of the the audio is locked um, and that's all done and the edit is, is locked the final thing that happened on our project was the color grade and again um, that's something that some of you guys may or may not do or know a bit about um, but it's something that we like to do for all of our projects, unless they're very quick turnaround. Um, and in, even on the quick turnaround ones, there's always a little bit of tweaking of levels and white balancing and all that kind of stuff. And similar to uh, the audio stuff that I've just talked about, there's, there's two kind of sides of it. There's color correction, there's color grading. Color correction is sort of adjusting things to make sure that everything is normalized, that there aren't any kind of wild white balance shifts or exposure fluctuations or anything like that. It's, it's kind of a technical corrective pass. The color grade is more about creating a, 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 a creative artistic look and film. So I was very lucky uh, using the kind of networking and the contacts that I developed, as I mentioned earlier, to actually have the to actually have the film graded at um, one of the big Soho based London post production houses called Molinaire. Uh, I was very lucky to have it graded in one of the suites that they actually used to grade among other things the uh, last two series of The Crown for example um, and again this is where having a team and having more people involved can just help elevate the work you know I could have probably done the colour grading myself. Um, pretty good at colour grading. I think it's an important part of being a cinematographer today, given that we all shoot in log and raw formats often, or a combination of the two, that you need to have control over that image throughout the entire pipeline to ensure that your visual sort of ideas are not skewed in the post-production process. But by having a professional colorist, and that's all they do, cut grade the image, it enabled us to just add another layer of quality to this. And so one of the things we've done is to skew things in a more towards a more filmic palette with things like film grain and a more filmic color response. Um, but also try and push things more towards having quite a painterly uh, color and painterly feel to them, which was what I mentioned earlier, which we started in the shooting, which was to try and shoot things in a way that matched Neil's artwork. And that was something we were really able to complete with uh, the color grade and ensuring that the, the colors of the cinematography really matched the richness and the, 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 the colors of uh, Neil's oil painting work. Um, so that was something that was really exciting to do. And I think the, the results speak for themselves that they, the, the colorist has been able to extract every last little ounce of kind of detail uh, out of the the footage we captured and we've been able to go in and do crazy things like uh, in the, the the scene where he's walking through the, uh, the the gallery each individual painting in that shot has been power windowed and tracked and graded individually so that each of the paintings looks 
correct and incredible and it's it's that level of extra detail and polish that again is all in service of the story and guiding the viewer's eye and guiding the viewer's attention to where at any one given point I as a director want them to be. So that just about wraps up this masterclass on creating emotive story-driven branded content. I really really hope that throughout all of that you've been able to, to kind of capture one or two little golden nuggets of information and maybe I've been able to sort of change the way you you think about the work that you create. I think some of the biggest things are, are, are sort of practicing and whether that be lighting or camera work or or anything like that and also for this kind of work honing your eyes and ears for a good story and also becoming a, a really good listener because that's going to help you immensely with interviewing. The other thing of course as well as I keep kind of sound like a broken record is planning and learning to understand and appreciate how vital planning is in creating good pieces of work regardless of whether it's branded content, commercial, corporate, narrative, doc, planning is key to the success. As they say, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. The other thing as well is making sure that you're picking the right tools for the right job. As I mentioned right at the start, I'm a great believer in that and I don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all solution to anything. You have to make sure that the story and the project is leading your, de your decisions and choices about kit, not the other way around. So for this sort of story, as I mentioned, I needed something that was lightweight, durable, gave me great picture quality, wasn't particularly power hungry, and just ultimately got out of the way and let me concentrate on the filmmaking, which is what I look for in any kit. And that's why at the time I used a C300 Mark II. And I think today for this type of project, I'd probably be looking to using a C300 Mark III. So you can find out a lot more about a lot of the kit that I used on this project, as well as some of those other Canon cameras uh, on the WEX website. And if you want to know more about me, you can uh, visit one of my websites or you can follow me on social media. The links will be in the description below. WEX also have a whole host of other fantastic masterclasses available for you to watch and enjoy. There's so many to choose from, but my personal choice would be one of the upcoming Change the Image series with Malkia Roberts, where she's looking at photographing and lighting for different skin types. We'd love to see the kind of work that you guys are creating as well. So be sure to, to tag anything you share with the hashtag WEX Masterclass. Thanks for listening. I really hope that that was useful for you and I really hope that that helps you enjoy and improve your filmmaking going forward. Thanks.